One conundrum that has plagued my mind, especially at some of the worst stages of my depression, was that of the fully actualized person. The theme is as old as time, and goes by many different names. Enlightened one, self-actualized, superhuman. Humanity, in their bid to understand their greatest heroes, enshrines them in such a way that implies that they have unlocked some great secret of human experience. That they somehow found a way around all the little things that hold normal people back and were able to put any of their thoughts directly into action. Of course, it's not new to discuss this problem in right-wing circles, since they're prone to believing in great man theory, and have tried to convince themselves that an affinity for tradition and an abstinence from what they lazily label as degeneracy is that key to being an outstanding individual. This theory interests people not just because it's seen as charity to vulnerable white men, but it's alluring since there's a spiritual, mystical aspect to this type of thinking. While I'm sure this philosophical problem is more often seen through the lens of fascism, my interactions with it are seen through the lens of disability. As I said earlier, this idea of the fully actualized person was on my mind the most during the worst parts of my depression, and I'd like to break down how my experiences with it over the years affected my relationship with this idea. For anyone worried, I'm doing just fine these days, and my further discussion about depression will be lightweight and thus not deserving of a content warning. My flavor of depression has similar symptoms to most. Hopelessness, suicidality, unfounded guilt, anhedonia. You get the idea. However, one symptom that stood out after dealing with depression for a couple of years was a big lack of energy. Before I was medicated for this symptom, I would get ample sleep, be up for a few hours, and then immediately be hit with the tiredness equal to that of a college student who had just finished doing an all-nighter without coffee. The wakefulness I did experience was often not useful since I wouldn't have enough energy to do the things I enjoyed, like playing games or listening to music. Going through such a drastic life change due to these symptoms made it very easy for me to draw comparisons between myself in that moment and who I was when I was still in my early to mid-teens. Back then, I was energetic and working on hobby projects daily. With the depression symptoms, however, I was barely capable of doing fun things for myself regularly, let alone hobbyist projects. It took a long time for me to come to terms with using the word disability to refer to this effect depression had on me. Frankly, this isn't too different from people who are cagey about the term PTSD because they think it only applies to war veterans. Similarly with the term disability, people are scared to use the term for invisible ones such as depression or anxiety. Anyways, living with a disability leaves one open to comparing themselves to how they were before it, like I did when I was new to the experience. I'd ask myself what I would have been doing if I'd stayed as capable as I was when I was younger. Eventually, that evolved into big picture questions, like what would someone be doing with that energy if they embodied it completely? Is there something I'm missing to hold on to that kind of capability? And most important to this video, is there such a thing as a fully actualized person who has reached the reasonable maximum of this capability? Yes, as a disabled person, I was fantasizing about having full capability. I tend to daydream a lot, so it's no surprise that I was thinking about the possibility of a person who could just take their thoughts and put them into action. The kind of movie-esque Mary Sue character who can one day just say, fuck it, go to all their neighbors asking to change the world, and eventually have everyone in the streets by nightfall, all because they were the first one to actually do anything to light the fires of change. Silly, I know, but this problem bothered me immensely. It was already hard feeling as if I was living in a shadow of the capabilities of my former self, let alone internally shaming myself about how I must be missing some sort of regimen to be that fully actualized person. The major twist here is that this problem didn't continue to bother me forever. I eventually found medications that helped, but did not cure, my condition in regards to energy, and after recontextualizing how I thought about this conundrum, realized that the fully actualized person does not exist. It's a myth at best, and a very unhealthy standard at worst. For some people, this realization is as simple as the kill your heroes route, where you discover that the highly actualized people you look up to have flaws of their own that aren't often discussed because the society of the spectacle cares more about the ubermensch narrative than painting venerable figures as being normal like the rest of us. They want to convince us, mayhaps for the sake of entertainment, that there's some special sauce inside of these people. Maybe they think it's the eccentricities of the artist, the wisdom of a CEO, or the superhuman restraint of a leader. The narrative at the end of the day is that these people have some kind of special sauce to them that led them to rise to these positions of notoriety. A better way to generalize this is that the message being pushed is one that claims that these people are more capable of creating opportunities than you. 
They're painting opportunity as something entirely individualized, and thus something that can be blamed on the individual instead of their environment. Less people over time are buying this narrative as late-stage capitalism progresses. Recent surveys have shown that people no longer believe hard work will reward them with a better life in this punishing system. And the reason they think about this all comes back to that word, opportunity. The special sauce these people on the top supposedly have allows them to be better at creating opportunities, that they're capable of taking ideas and putting them into action without issue. Now, I'm sure there are people who have genuine belief in the fully actualized or enlightened person being a real possibility, and that we just don't believe in it because to be truly at that stage is exceedingly rare. However, even if they did exist, they do so not because there's something special in them, unlike the rest of us, but because they were in an environment that enabled them to become as such. We do not create opportunities. We have cards dealt to us, and the only thing special about it is how we play the hand. And that doesn't mean you can play it to a superhuman degree to somehow negate your environment either. The wealthy love to stress a rags-to-riches story not because it's accurate, but because it plays into this false narrative that the reason they are where they are is because they're special somehow, and were able to play the same hand as you and I so well that they rose up to the top. This isn't reasonable nor healthy to believe. Your financial standing as an individual is heavily decided by the environmental factor of generational wealth, not to mention other peripheral factors such as social programs and safety nets. By no means am I trying to beat you down by implying that you cannot have dreams because you need to be realistic, but if you're aspiring to be like the kinds of people who are ultra-wealthy, you're aspiring for dreams that aren't your own in a way that benefits those who are already there. A carnival of cons finding new ways to trick you with MLMs, pyramid and Ponzi schemes, crypto, and whatever other gambling they can make you comfortable with. So what's a person to do in this system? The game's not only rigged from the start, but your capabilities change with age, so why bother? First, we have to give ourselves more credit for what we're actually doing in the world. I was more capable when I was younger because my life was planned out ahead of me, less was expected of me, and I'd yet to be disabled. With less weight on my shoulders, it's obvious I was going to run around more. Nowadays, being older and having to pave my way in a world that doesn't want to present me with predetermined paths to my own happiness, I will obviously move slower. I'm carrying more weight on my shoulders, and that's still worthy of praise. We are surviving during harsh times, existing in a world that isn't interested in our happiness, and are trying to be kind and moral in a world that encourages the opposite. Staying here while keeping ourselves and others happy is something to be proud of, even if we falsely believe that it's a simple act due to how easy it was when we were younger. These are tough times. The modern world is an economic and psychological battle zone, and we're trying our best to live with the trauma. This suffering is not normal, and you're a strong person for sticking it out with the rest of us, especially considering not all of us could make it. So, even if our progress doesn't feel as fast as more fortunate times during our lives, it's no less worthy of reward and gratitude. I'm sure this isn't new information to many of you, so my second piece of advice is to look at opportunities not as something we make, but threads we pull. In our environment, we are presented with many different threads to entertain, and it's our choices here that are important. I've helped dozens of people in profound ways over the years, not because I was some special human being who could create these valuable opportunities, but rather I saw potential threads in my interactions with others that I could pull to better their happiness. This might mean checking in with someone from time to time, or sending them relaxing music during difficult moments to help them push through it, focusing more on certain aspects of discussion or activities that make them the happiest, or even remembering what they like so I can send them such media if I find it out in the wild. To pull threads the best, it helps to think about interactions a bit like a role-playing game. Some options become more apparent based on what your skill set is on a given day. Did you have a conversation recently, or see something that pertains to the topic at hand? That's a new potential thread to pull. Are you considerably energetic in that moment, leading you to be able to joke around and lighten up the mood for whoever you're talking with? That's another thread. It's not fair to compare your character sheet to other parts of your life, because those characters existed in different environments, thus having their points spread into different skills. I had a lot more energy when I was younger, leading me to pull threads related to being bubbly in conversation to light up someone's mood. These days, I may not have the energy, but my skill points are in empathy and wisdom that allow me to chip away at the meaningful topics that can lead people to catharsis. And let's be real, sometimes I've already done a lot already in a given week, and need to take time for such abilities to be on cooldown. 
We all have these paradigm shifts where we reinvent ourselves and have different capabilities throughout our lives, and we're taking our changing skills for granted if we're still beating ourselves up for not being able to pull old threads despite new ones being right there for us to play with. It's easy to be bitter over loss than it is to realize what's new. Wishing we could be comfortable in doing the same thing forever is the language of death. Life is meaningful and fulfilling because we can be different people, inhabit different experiences, and apply new yet consistently helpful solutions to the world. When I was at my worst with depression, I was still having a hard time being at the crux of that paradigm shift. I was focusing more on old threads than new ones. I wanted to comfortably exist in the familiar times forever. These days, I realize how wrong I was for thinking that stability meant preventing change to compensate for an inability to adapt to it. Adapting to change doesn't mean that it will always be fair. It certainly isn't fair that I have to live with a disability, but it won't make it any easier if I was wishing that my life stayed the same and never changed in this way to keep me comfortable in my old ways. I think it helps to realize that threads aren't just about the roads to which we are offered that allow us to act on our environment, but also how we act on ourselves. It helps to acknowledge good days when we are blessed with energy and happiness, and utilize that accordingly. Meanwhile, it helps to acknowledge days where we don't feel our best, to reach out to those who make it bearable, and to do things that help us push through. While each of us may have a preference for a warm and sunny day or a cool and rainy night, it's unnatural to force the forecast to stay that way every day. It'd be crazy for someone to stay angry at the skies because they don't stay clear and blue year-round, yet we still don't fully internalize how degrading it is to do the same thing to our own emotions in our day-to-day -day lives. Happy days are for happy threads. Sad days are for sad threads. I can be more helpful to friends on a good day and have music and media to imbue myself with on a bad day. To realize that the superhuman is a myth and to not create opportunities but rather pull threads is a lesson in being human. We can either choose to fall for the individualistic propaganda and alienate ourselves until we lie down and rot, or we can choose to live as beings with interesting and shifting capabilities that can be used in ways healthy to ourselves and others. Anyone is capable of this lesson. You need not contain a special sauce or capability to internalize it, and this authenticity to the human condition helps us apply human solutions to human problems. To quote the Roman slave Terence, I am human, and I think nothing human is alien to me.